Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics in Research and Biotechnology series. This is a monthly series that brings together bioethicists, scientists, and other researchers to talk about ethical issues at the cutting edge of science. And today's topic is uh, absolutely at the cutting edge of science. The topic today is called Experimenting with Large Mammalian Brains Ex Vivo. Let me just go over a little bit of the uh, ground rules for today uh, before we get started with the introductions. This event is being recorded and it is live streamed on Facebook. The event video will be posted on the Center for Bioethics Facebook and YouTube pages later. We encourage you to submit questions along the way at any time. And to do that, you have to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat box, use the Q&A feature. I will select questions at the end to uh, pose to our participants for discussion. And I really look forward to that interaction with you, our audience. If you have any technical issues, then you can use the chat feature to send a message to the panelists or to the staff that could help you. Um, upcoming events are listed on that website, bioethics.hms.harvard.edu. And uh, with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker and the topic. So today we have our, our first speaker, who is Nanad Sistan. He is an MD, PhD. He is professor of neuroscience, comparative medicine, genetics, and psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine. Back in 2019, he was actually named one of the 10 people who mattered in science by the journal Nature. Um, his topic today will uh, take us through his research uh, that led to that, uh, that, that designation by the journal Nature of being uh, the ones to watch in 2019. My name is Hsu Hian. I'm Director of Research Ethics and I'm a faculty member in the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. I'm also a professor of bioethics and philosophy at Case Western Reserve University. So we're gonna start with Dr. Sestan and he uh, will take us through a discussion of his research for about 30 to 40, 45 minutes or so. Then we have a special discussant after that, Dr. Robert Trug, who I will introduce at that time. And after some thoughts from Dr. Trug, we will then open it up for the Q&A session. So again, I encourage you to ask questions along the way by using the Q&A box. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Sessa. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Insu, for your kind introduction. And uh, you can see my presentation. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, for some reason, it's forcing me to leave. I don't understand what's happening. Okay. Uh, okay. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. Thank you and all the members of your center for inviting me. Of course, it would be much nicer if we were in one of my favorite cities. But uh, we are experiencing a global crisis. And... Uh, health crisis, of course, <laughs> more than health crisis. And I hope we'll have another opportunity to do this in person. Uh, and then Ed, we can see your uh, presentation view. So just FYI. Sorry? We can see your notes in your presentation I'll view. I'll just a second, and then I don't know what's happening. Uh, can you see now? Uh, no, now we don't see your screen. Because uh, I am having a really difficulty because I be, I'm using, can you? Okay, let me just try again to share. Sorry about this because I've been experiencing difficulties with my screen. Oh, I know what happened. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Yep. I apologize for this. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Now you should. You see my screen now? Yes. And you see my laser. Oops. My laser pen. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So. Um, so. So as Insu said, I will share a little bit about our work that started several years ago and really on ex vivo normotemic preservation or restoration of circulation and, 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 and <coughs> cellular activity in the large mammalian brain several hours after, after post-mortem interval. And it's really that I get the opportunity to, to talk to the audience that uh, to the colleagues outside the neuroscience community, so especially those that are interested in bioethical aspects of this study. And so I really look forward to your feedback. So uh, I would like to say that I have no commercial support for this presentation, but however, I am listed and my colleagues on the IT that is held by the university, so just to let you know. And so before I dive into the meat of the presentation, really, I would like to provide a brief outline of what we are 
going to discuss today. Also, I would like to state that it's my hope that by the end of this presentation, sorry, uh, I may convey and potentially convince you that the brain and specifically cells in the brain uh, can demonstrate a higher tolerance to ischemic injury than is widely accepted. And the way that I will be arriving there is by starting off with a little bit of background information on the brain. And what is really important in context of this pre presentation, it's high metabolic demands. And then I will examine some brief data on brain tissue responses following circulatory arrest and global ischemia. And then I will describe the central research question and hypothesis that our team has tested. And that he, and really show you how we tested this, show you the design and establishment of technology we named Brain X, uh, Brain, uh, and this stands for Brain X Vivo, and which consists of three co critical components I would like to introduce you immediately. Uh, one is a surgical approach by which we actually uh, isolate the brain and its vasculature, and then component or technology by itself has a two components that are critical. One is the extracorporeal uh, perfusion device, and the third is a synthetic a cellular cytoprotective perfume. So just think basically the perfusion box and a solution. And then just to be able to do this ex vivo, we also had to really design a way how to extract the brain from a big brain and uh, from the big scalp actually. And then I will describe how we validated this technology as a research platform using post-mortem big brains. I'll explain how, what was the motivation to do this because I think it's probably interesting to all of you why, how we came about this and how we did it and, and, and and finally, of course, uh, nothing is created in the vacuum. And so I would like to acknowledge two amazing colleagues who have done most of the work that I will describe today. Uh, Zvonimir Versella, who is still in the lab, and Stefano Daniele, who is now back in the medical school. He actually successfully defended his PhD, but it's back at medical school. And so I am a neuroscientist, and until recently, I've been really exclusively studying basically developing them. I and specifically, I was interested in understanding how different cell types and, and their synaptic circuits are generated in the developing brain. And this is really what we have been doing for years. And recently, actually, we came upon something that I will describe how we came up with this idea. And it led us to really a surprising discovery about brain's resilience. And that's what I will talk about today. I will not talk about the brain development, but I really wanted to mention that to you to get understanding how we came to what I'm going to talk to you about it today. And, uh, but before I do that, let me, let me tell you about, about the brain. And so as you probably all already know, the brain is the most complicated, uh, complex structure that we know in, in the known universe. And what is important, at least in the context of what we study in the lab, is at the root of what makes us unique as species. And there are approximately 170,000 billion neurons in the, in the central nervous system, of which 86 billion are neurons. And, and these neurons need to be wired very precisely for brain to function properly. And, and, and to explain this complexity and understand why brain is so unique among organs. It's not that it's just associated with us as a species, but it also, it's really, when you think about uh, an energy demand is really unique. And the reason is that if you take these 86 billion neurons, they need to con be connected precisely and they need to maintain those connections. And they connect using, has been estimated, this is not our work, 850,000 kilometers of fibers, which is more than twice the distance from here to the moon and around 600 trillion synapses. I mean, this is really I mean, crazy numbers. And, and the pattern of this incredibly complex connectivity is what provides the basis for cognitive functions and, and behaviors that distinguish individuals and species. And, and this is what we are trying to understand, how this wiring diagram is formed during the, the development. And, and what is important, but what is important to know for this presentation is that the brain is highly metabolically active. And while it presents only 2% of the, of the body weight, the brain consumes 20% uh, of oxygen and 25% of, of glucose, which is more than any other organ, even if you adjust for the number of cells. And, 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 and. and so high energy requirements of the brain is, is fulfilled by constant transport into the brain 
with the blood. And so what blood does, it actually brings oxygen, brings nutrients, and, 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 and removes the waste. So that's basically what blood does. And, and the main reason this gets uh, uh, disrupted is, is that the flow of blood to the brain can be slowed down and even completely stopped. And the most common reason for that is cardiac arrest. And as all you know very well, cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of death and, and disability. And, and basically, I think I, I read somewhere that it's almost around 20 million people die a year in, and it's number one cause of death, actually, in the United States and most of other developing countries. And around 20 million people die worldwide uh, from the cardiac arrest. And, and, and this is, and the survival rate of cardiac arrest is not that great, it's somewhere between I think seven to 10% survival rate. And this is further complicated by the fact that up to 50% of surviving individuals go to, on to display a persistent neurological, many neurological deficits. And of course, this leads to significant impairment in the overall quality of life. And this is largely due to the fact that brain has very limited energy reserves. I mean, there is no fat in the brain. I mean, there's a lot of fat, but it's used for myelin. And the brain cells, some of which I will simplify here and, 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 and illustrate it here, have high basic metabolic rates. And the reason for that is if you just think about 86 billion neurons, they are constantly firing. I mean, they cannot be actually, you know, they cannot rest. I mean, they cannot hibernate. And basically they have to constantly fire and send out some potentials and along this 850,000 kilometers of axons and dendrites, okay? And that requires a continuous flow of blood to the brain to supply, of course, oxygen and nutrients, while also carrying away metabolic waste product that these cells produce during their normal function. And thus, you would not be surprised, and probably you all know this, that actually ancient Greeks told that basically brain is a radiator because when they look at the brain, there were so many blood vessels. And the reason you have so many blood vessels is they need to bring nutrients and oxygen and remove the metabolic waste. And so we recently became very interested in understanding what happens to the brain when blood flow stops completely, okay? Such in the case of, of, of cardiac arrest and, and, and or death. And, and importantly, whether we can develop a technology to better study cellular processes and including connections and, and really potentially delay stop or maybe even reverse them to salvage the tissue, okay? And as I mentioned to you earlier, this is not something that we were working on. And it's really, I would say, was a serendipitous uh, discovery and observation. And I'll take you in the next couple of slides how we get to that. Uh, before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, sorry, I think my slide did not advance. And so let me tell you a little bit about um, what happens to the brain in, 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 in example of a cardiac arrest or, or, or you know, when you stop blood flow or, or in, in this case, or it could be that. And now, you know, what are the responses of the brain and outcomes following this? And what it happens that when you stop blood flow or when you die, basically, is that you have something that is basically global ischemia. Your cells are now deprived completely of oxygen. There is no blood flow. There is no removal of, 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 of metabolic waste. And so what it happens is, so to, to really illustrate, to keep this simple, I'm going to show you really a couple of really uh, groundbreaking studies that really dived into this long time ago, almost 60 decades ago, and, and some little bit more recent. And so what happens at the molecular level is that the key metabolites such as glucose, sorry, ATP and phosphocreatine, and so here are, basically they dock precipitously within the first minute of interrupted blood flow. These are components that you need for neurons to basically work, not just you neurons, know, for every other cells. On the other hand, some other metabolites such as lactate, which is actually produced uh, in, 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 without oxygen, actually increase steadily soon after. And, and, and really, so, you know, as substantiating my earlier point is that, that the energy reserves within the brains are highly limited. And this is what the problem is, is that you have all of these 86 billion neurons. They need these critical component 
glucose, ATP, phosphocreatine, and some others, and then basically they are depleted immediately. There are no reserves in the metabolic brain, and the brain is really basically anyway. So, but what happens with the, you know, and so what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that global electrical activity, and here is a study done by uh, Hosman and Sato in 1970s, basically what it happens is that global electrical activity, which is what we need to think most deeply about the entire study, is what is required for higher order cognitive function, just normal functioning of the brain, and most important in the context of uh, bioethical consideration consciousness, drops to a completely flat line. And this happens basically within 14 seconds of the onset of, of, of global ischemia. So basically within 14 seconds, and this is done actually in CAT, that they have done this study in other large mammals, and, and, and really tells you a little about how sensitive brain is to lack of oxygen. And basically within the 14 seconds, you lose your EEG signal. Basically there is no global, coordinated global electrical activity. Basically, you lose your consciousness, and 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 as you would not be, you know, of course, not surprising is uh, is that, you know, so what is the correlate of this, you know, and of course, studies, you know, and these are the pioneering studies by Cole and Corda in in nineteen fifties, and what they published their seminal findings in, in not just one but actually a series of the paper on the outcome of resuscitation from the cardiac arrest and established the so called four minutes rule. And they found that those patients who were resuscitated within four minutes had much better outcome. Okay, so this is under four minutes than those that were resuscitated uh, over four minutes. And 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 if you put together this molecular, um, sorry, I have two screens. That's what I realize now. It's happening on my monitor when I press this. And so uh, when you look at what happens to molecular. Uh, 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 reagents that are required for neurons to, to survive. It's basically they are, the, 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 they are lost within basically minutes uh, to electrical activity. And then what happens in something that is clinically relevant, which is a cardiac arrest. And so all these together studies really demonstrate and indicate it's something that actually, you know, we all know from history and, and the, 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 the brain is highly vulnerable to interruption of blood flow. And importantly, brain cells are universally damaged or die within a narrowly defined time point after cessation of, of blood circulation. So that is really, and, and the clinical really work over the last, you know, more than, you know, not just in, in our sense and just both historically as well as the clinical work in last probably two centuries really support this view that brain is extremely sensitive and brain is uh, However, that was, you know, I went to medical school. That was my, you know, really what I accepted. And, and really clinical work really showed that that is really true. However, over the years, there has been multiple lines of observation that call to question finality of, of cellular viability minutes or even after, after that, okay? And I'm going to show you two papers that really helped us form this hypothesis and, and try to pursue this question, okay? And so one important study uh, among these is from Dick Swab and, and his colleagues in the Netherlands. And actually, I, I was following his work because he's an you know, important neuroscientist who had done really fundamental work. And I remember this, this paper when it came out, you know, a little bit, like I would say, it was maybe yeah, 18 years ago, uh, and which showed that viable tissue and cells can be harvested from adult human brain up to eight hours uh, after that and maintain ex vivo or in this case, they use cell cultures for a prolonged period of time. And actually what they show that patients, these cultures can be maintained. I think that, uh, please forgive me if I'm not correct, but I put it here on the slides, it's like 78 days. So the bottom line of this story is they, were, they took a post-mortem brain from the donors that died, you know, eight hours and, and experienced to some extent, probably combination of warm, and a little bit called ischemia because most of these cases is the bodies are refrigerated. They harvested the brain. This is an adult brain. That's also another important thing to keep in concern. And they make tissue, organotypic tissue slices, and they show actually really remarkably surprising preservation of, of, of tissue. I mean, neurons survived. There were some cells that they could study connections, and then and, and they, you know, they even did EM, show that actual synapses were preserved. And, and again, this is eight hours, and this is really against, goes against what we know in, in clinical 
uh, cases as well as what we know about really tremendously uh, quick depletion of, 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 of metabolites as well as the loss of global electrical activity. And well, you know, you know, I, we were thinking about this and, and, and but also really what really, uh, really stimulate us to really take this question more seriously and test this hypothesis was that our own lab observed similar also several years ago. And, and, and in our studies of brain development, what we were doing, we have been collecting post-mortem tissue and we observed that viable tissue and cells can be harvested from brain that were, you know, again, combination of short warm ischemia, but mainly cold stored up to 49 hours after death actually. And, and, and actually this is really not, it's anecdotal. We actually received two brains that were shipped from a brain bank to us and they, fortunately, the, 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 the courier that did this, you know, missed the airplane and, and, and the brains stood on wet ice and, and were delivered to us. This, this actual case that you are looking here is from the brain that was 49 hours PMI that came to our lab. And, and actually, I did not expect this to work. And, and actually, I asked somebody who was in the lab to really, okay, take the brain, you know, see, try to learn a little bit. This person was doing a little bit more computational. And I said, you know, it's good to know, and you know, we should fix it and you know prepare, but maybe you could practice to make organotypic tissue slides. So this is something similar to what Dick Swab did and his colleague, but this is a commonly used technique that we used in the lab using, uh, let's say, mice and other species. And 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 you know, his name is Andre came to me and after several weeks, he said, Nenad, you know, you have to look at these cultures and they are really growing. And, and, and again, this is not just dissociated cultures. I mean, this is really, so these cells still have some, you know, their dendrites, their synapses, and they were incredibly healthy. They grew them for several weeks and, you know, really made me think about, not just me, but the entire lab think about how is this possible, you know? And, and again, this is not something unique. I'm almost, everybody have, has observed this who worked in, in a neuroscience lab. If you take a, you know, like dissect mouse brain, you cannot dissect all of them at once. So you can keep them on ice for several, but the quality of tissue. And on the other hand, we were actually collecting, you know, uh, bioptic tissue and the tissue was maybe not even better than this. And so really, really made us to think about it. And so basically what we, we concluded from these studies that not all is lost, at least immediately. And that the cell death in the post-mortem brain follows more a gradual and stepwise process instead of occurring uh, uh, in a very narrow defined time window immediately after cessation of blood flow. So basically is your cells are not going to die. And you know, there is a work that supported this even before we started to think about this. And, and it's normal that people made cultures from the brains that were, you know, had several hours post-mortem delay. And means that basically that post-mortem brain cells, and in this case, it's a, it's a post-mortem brain, but think about this is such a cardiac arrest and stroke where there is a, to some extent, focal or, or, or global ischemia, they may have the capacity, and at least in the cases of two studies I mentioned, this capacity has been maintained ex vivo uh, to fully recover at, when it comes to their cellular function in tissue cultures, and again, under appropriate experimental conditions. And we were really, struck by these observations and we, question, we started to really question whether we could translate these findings from a small tissue specimens and dissociate the cells to fully intact brain. And here is an important point that I would like you to, to convey at, at, at the moment, is, is, is that the reason we were interested in doing this in the whole brain is that even if you do organotypic tissue cultures, you lose connectivity. You maintain local connections, but the connections that make the white matter is lost. And this is what our lab was interested in studying is how genes control the formation of those long range connections in the cerebral cortex. But there was no way to study them because either you have to dissociate the cells or you have to make organotypic slices cultures or you use an animal to trace the connections and stuff like that. Well, while you can trace connections in, in let's say mouse or even some non human primates, most of animals are actually not uh, you know, you, this is not applicable. And, 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 and we really were thinking, okay, maybe we can really capitalize on these observations in, 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 in cultures and really try to do this with a fully intact brain. And, and so basically we hypothesized basically that, that, that under, again, 
appropriate experimental conditions, circulation, and thus cell functions in interclash brain may remain, uh, you know, have the same capacity for restoration even multiple hours after death. And not just by dissociating them and culture, but maybe doing this in the whole brain. And, and, uh, and again, just to remind you and refresh you by really testing this hypothesis instead of like taking cultures in a fully intact brain, we thought that we might be able to better understand how cells in the brain react to circulatory arrest because that was also not well understood. And if we could somehow intervene and to revive or salvage or maintain these cells and, and okay. And so what, you know, so we started very naively in the beginning, we actually thought, okay, we can take the post-mortem brains and, and maybe we can find a way to study cells and connections and preserve again, for, for, sorry, I'm like a little parrot, to, to preserve a 3D organization, which was never possible before. And that was our really initial idea how to do this, okay? And, and, and after brainstorming about how to test this, we chose pigs for multiple reasons. And, 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 and also thinking about this and, and really having the medical background and, and several members of our team were you know, physicians, uh, practicing physicians, I'm not one, and you know, we realized that actually we should really talk to somebody. And actually, one of the first people we talked about was Tim Latham, who was uh, who has the Yale at the Bioethics Center here at Yale, trying to really get insight into this. We also talked to colleagues who are really expert in this, and including Steve Waxman and other colleagues who really were studying, uh, you know, regeneration, uh, recovery from cardiac arrest or or hypoxia and ischemia. Try to understand how to do this and whether it can be even done. And, and one thing that came out of these discussions is that we should do this in pigs, okay. And we chose pigs for, for multiple reasons. So first, and we really, you know, we were thinking, okay, what if you write IACUC protocol, you wanna do this? I mean, you know, just, it has not been done. And, and I really wanted to be sure. Again, we didn't wanna, we wanted to test the ischemia. So this is why we chose post-mortem inter. We, we were not interested in keeping a brain alive. That was not our intention, just to make it also clear. And, and we wanted to see, okay, can we develop a technique that will help us recover this and restore cells in intact, but like what we have done and others have done, many, many other labs have done in tissue cultures, okay? And so thinking about this, how to do this, and of course the first choice was, okay, let's do this in rodents. And I think I was the one against doing this in rodents. And the reason for that, yeah, I have a small brain. And so after really brainstorming and talking to some colleagues at other university, it came to us obvious that actually we should do this in, 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 in pigs. And, and so first pigs are processed every day for food production uh, uh, and their brains are routinely discarded. And in the USA, I think several years ago, there were, I think over 120 million pigs were processed that year. And, and, and we interpreted these figures as 120 million missed opportunities to study the brain. And, and, and we wanted to take advantage of this procurement method. And, and because it has an important, not just ethical consideration, you know, really trying to do something without using an animal, you know, if you can do this, that, I mean, that's a plus, but also important experimental implications that were not obvious to us in the beginning. You know, and as I said, it's better, uh, not me, but many people say it's better to be lucky than smart. And I'll get point to that why that's important. And so, Again, great, no animals were sacrificed solely for this research. Uh, we basically, what we did is actually called the <laughs> only local uh, uh, food production facility. And, and, and we asked them, you know, what do you do? I mean, they use meat, you know, uh, and, and they did not use the brain and they basically gave us a skull that was really removed uh, and, and base. And, you know, uh, so, you know, we had now opportunities to really think about this and practice this, okay? The second reason we also chose pigs is that, you know, I was surprised when I look at the pig brain. I mean, I have seen it in the pictures, but it's really, it's, and it's smaller than human brain, but it's actually it's the actually same size as uh, rhesus macaque brain, which is the most commonly studied uh, non-human primates. And it actually, Unlike macaque, it has more gyri and 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 I and it has a really a large white matter and and we felt this might be important, you know, eventually to translate potential treatments directly to humans. And again, nothing has been done so far in humans, and 
you know, but we felt whatever you do, you should do it in a mammal that you can get an access to the brains, that you that, that the brain is large, and this really uh, pig ended up a really good model for this. And again, just not availability, but it weights around I think eight hundred grams, which is uh, like like seven point five times smaller than human brain which is like around 1,400 grams. And again, but it was really surprised. I was totally surprised at the same size as, as the reason it's macaque brain. It's giant which is really make it. Better. And it has a similar white to gray uh, ratio uh, to the brain. And this is an important thing because if you look at the rodents, white matter is like maybe 5%, it's small. And hemodynamically, it's a different problem. While when you take a, a, a a pig brain that is almost 100 times larger has a large percentage, almost 30% of white matter. And all of this made us really think that we should use pig rather than, let's say, mice or rats, you know, most commonly studied mammals. And again, just to repeat myself, because they have small and less complex brains, okay? Uh, anyway, so uh, normally, as I mentioned to you is earlier, is that normally in, 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 in life, in you know, vivo, brain maintains homeostasis to a coordinated function of variety of peripheral organs. Remember, you need blood to bring nutrients, to bring oxygen, but also remove metabolic waste. And that metabolic waste is processed by organs such as liver. You need oxygen to get to the lung. And, and, and outside the body, this is not simply not the case. And, and, and therefore, in order to uh, maintain viability of, of intact post-mortem brain ex vivo, we needed to engineer an extra corporal perfusion system that pumps, in this case, a solution into the brain, but also mechanically mimics many of those organs. An important point that I would like to convey here is that we decided not to use blood in the beginning. And, and there were many reasons for that. So again, we set up a committee of colleagues who we felt are experts in the field. And, 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 and we thought about how to do this now, if we want to do it. And, and so uh, blood would be, you know, some suggest, okay, it's easy, you know, there is nothing to think about. But we wanted to really use some of the features that, 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 that were created in, 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 in culture systems. And we also wanted to create something that is synthetic and is standardized so that each brain can be perfused with the identical solution. And, and this really, I think it's important in, in creating a process where you can iterate, iterate and learn from the existing. And if you use a blood, you have to gain you know, each animal is slightly different. So actually that was also one other reason and ended up being really important feature, which we took in consideration just to make sure that that, that, that we think all ethical aspects in, in, of the study. Anyway, and so, okay, now we have come up and took us almost three years to develop this solution, just to let you know, this was not overnight, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about how we created this, but we also had to pump this solution. And, and, and then we talked to companies that have been doing this, by the way, you know, actually. And, 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 you know, we realized that, that there are machines that teachers cannot do this, okay? And, and for the reasons that I'll, I'll try to explain. And in, so in doing this, actually, we wanted to mechanically and as well as physiologically mimic some of the key peripheral organs, because again, brain cannot, and it does not function in, in, in vacuum. And so in, in doing so, we incorporate the components that mimic heart and where we can control flow, uh, rate, pulsatility, and pressure. You know, the blood is not continuously pumped through the organs. It actually creates the veins, okay? And that ended up being an important, I'm not going to talk much about it just because I think it's a little bit more technical details, but I'm happy to in, 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 in rest after the questions. And also, uh, we also mimic the lungs so that we can modulate the gases and get, and also we uh, uh, finally mimic functions of kidney and liver so that we can control electrolytes, metabolites, and, and especially pH and, 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 and infusion of, of buffers and stuff like that. And so we assemble all these components and, 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 so, and then we did this with isolated brain. And doing this with isolated brain was also an important thing. And in planning phase became clear to us because when we talked to colleagues who actually use pigs for their research, it became obvious that actually this would be almost cost prohibitive to doing pigs. And, and, and we also created by extracting the brain, actually this is a whole probably presentation how Zvonimir, Stefan and colleagues have succeeded in extracting the brain and maintaining the vascular. Okay? And actually, so we created a closed temperature control loop, okay? And so this way we control what comes, what goes into the brain and what comes out of the brain. 
and the volume of that is substantially smaller than you would have that with the whole peak. And so this allowed us to basically really test conditions of the perfusion system. And, and, and now one of the, is that, uh, and so this is how we did it then, and if you have questions. So we created this solution and normally uh, this, uh, so the solution has components. So the way we did that, we had to have an oxygen carrier. So we use a, uh, in, in, in collaboration with the HBO therapeutic leader in, 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 in the field, actually they created a polymerized version of the bovine hemoglobin, which is exchange, gas exchange in this case. Then we tested, we tested targeting metabolic components, cell death inhibitors, inflammatory modulators. And then secondly, we also thought about it. We weren't sure how successful we would be. We had, we had no idea what will happen. And so we really wanted to be sure that we don't do anything stupid. And so basically also we wanted to include neuronal inhibitors. And also there is a second reason for that is exotoxicity has been known as one of the main mechanisms that neurons get damaged in the stroke or, or even in uh, other examples of ischemia, basically. And so we wanted also to target that. We also created mitotic stress inhibitors and antioxidants and free radical scavengers. Over, we rationally designed this package and tested it over almost 300 brains, okay, in order not to only promote recovery following prolonged period of interrupted blood flow. So we could not just pump the blood. Actually, you cannot do this with the blood. You cannot, and we wanted to be basically sure uh, that we can do this, recover the cells, but also maintain their variability while really making sure that they do not create a global activity. Also through the entire course of the experiment, we actually measured the activity using an ECOG system, which was a clinical system done by somebody who does this and was actually director of the imaging center. And so basically we decided to use a four hours PMI, multiple reasons why four hours. Again, we did not want to hook up the live brain to the machine. That was not our intention. We wanted to test four hours was two reasons. One, we wanted to test the prolonged uh, ischemia, but also basically we wanted to practically we could not do it faster because we also get these brains from the slaughterhouse. And so we had the four group, we had a group that we call one PMI hour, where we flushed, we also flushed the brain actually at, at, at the slaughterhouse, actually, you know, when we remove it. And then we would extract this brain, bring it to lab, take us one hour to get it back to the lab. And then we had another group, which was a 10 hour PMI where the brains were left unattached at the room temperature. Then we have a control perfusion where we try to perfuse the brains using actually our, con Perfusion was lacking key components. And then also we have what we call BEX or brain egg shorter perfusion. And we started perfusion four hours after uh, that was uh, killed or sacrificed. And also it takes a lot of long time to extract the pig brain from the skull. That was probably, the pig is probably not good model for that. It has a very thick but porous skull and, and, and just was really, I would say complicated. And so basically these are our, and then we perfuse for six hours and the total perfusion, total period after that was 10 hours. We stopped after six hours for two reasons. We could not perfuse control brains and they were basically really degradating. And after six hours of perfusion, we saw tremendous differences and also for cost and many other reasons, we actually decided to stop for that, okay? So, uh, and indeed, so first of all, can we perfuse the brain and, and indeed, as you can see here with ultra uh, Doppler antras, ultrasound, uh, sorry, when I press this without controlling, uh, you can see that basically, uh, so our perfusate is echogenic. So basically you can see it on, 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 on ultrasound Doppler and you can see uh, reveal robust flow, uh, uh, red color means a flow through internal carotid anterior, all major bless, blood vessels, both in anterior, posterior parts of the brain. And importantly, you can see that, that our waveform, uh, waveform, uh, wave, uh, waveform analysis uh, show through, this is a through pericalosal artery reveals the cardiac-like biphasic uh, uh, waveforms indicating a low vascular resistance and also suggesting that downstream vascular blood cells are, are, are functional or, or, or uh, uh, patent. And then also to assess, we can also show this is a brain being perfused and you can press this cortical vein. This is on the surface of the cortex. And basically you can deplete it and you can see that that uh, blood, uh, it, in this case, it's not blood, it's our perfusion, which is actually read as blood, okay? And, 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 and you can see that it's re re it means that the capillaries going from anterior, from uh, arteries to vein is functional. And then also the blood vessels, we saw 
the blood vessels are also functional that we tested basically we wanted to see by administering nimodipine uh, which is a cer um, you know cerebral cerebral vasodilatator and 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 basically indicating that basically that uh, if you inject the bolus, you should have dilatation of blood vessels, and that's exactly what we saw. Basically, to make story short of all of this, and finally, sorry, I forget, we also added uh, bismuth nanoparticles and then re re imaged the entire brain using a, 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 a CT scanner, and you can see beautiful, uh, really, uh, uh, perfusion of the entire brain. Uh, we also checked in an MRI how brains look, and in ten hour, in in our ten hours there is a decomposition of the uh, degradation of of the brain. Uh, you can see collapse of the ventricles, collapse of the tissue. You see even gas pockets which are formed when the brain is degrading. Uh, if we try to do the, the control perfusate, uh, uh, basically the brain goes in edema. It cannot be perfused even if you want to uh, forcefully perfuse it. This is exactly what happens also in skin that the brain goes in edema. And in our brain, this is a uh, brain MRI under the perfusion of in, uh, with our technology. You see really beautiful uh, contrast between white and gray matter. We also measured the, the and there is no decomposition. Uh, the actual radiology study was a live brain, and this is a veterinary radiologist. And basically, we also measured the, the water content and showed that actually water content in our perfused technique, but not in, in, in the control one is similar to normal, indicating that it prevents cerebral edema, which is one of the key problems in brain injuries and schema. And just so I next three slides, I'll show you what happens to neurons, what happens to glial cells, and what happens to function of the neuron. And so basically, one of the areas that has been known, most known for being susceptible to ischemia is a hippocampus CA1 field. This is a hippocampus in, in, in one hour PMI, uh, 10 hours PMI, a control perfusate and Bax perfusate. You can see the the, the, the red color of, of, of our perfusate in the in, in blood vessels. Uh, you can see that in in one after one hour, uh, cells become swollen. That's from edema. And then while in ten hours and control perfusate, that cells are washed out. Basically, they are dead. While in our perfusate, you can see in our control, you can see beautiful cells that are not oval, as you can see here. We see that same number of cells as we would see to one hour control. Again, this is not a zero hour control, just because at that time we could not get uh, it within zero hours. Uh, we also observe a, this is a staining with any of the fine neuronal marker. You can see preservation of neurons comparable to one hour PMI, but not in the two 10 hours controls. And you can see that basically there is a disactivated caspase staining. You can see that there is a significant down regulation of activated caspase, which is a proxy of cell death. And so basically, when it comes to this technology, it preserves neuronal organization and reduces a activation of caspase, which is a known to be activator of cell death. We also wanted to test what happens to, 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 to glial cells, and, and glial cells in the brain are astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and, and microglia. And this is a control brain. You can see uh, uh, this is a control brain, and you can see. Uh, so in red are uh, GFAP astrocytes, in green are microglial cells, and you can see beautifully through entire cortex and the white matter, you see both astrocytes and microglia. You don't see that after 10 hours, there is a significant loss of glial cells. Also, in patches, basically brain becomes like a yogurt. You have to understand we do this at 37 degrees, okay? And this is our back perfusate, and, and you can see similar uh, distribution of astrocytes and microglia. They are not dying or at least they are not disappearing. We see that they are a little bit uh, thicker process, which is a sign of activated astrocytes and microglia, nothing surprising. And then we wanted to know, um, are they uh, functioning? And previous studies have shown that actually in vitro, in, sorry, uh, in this case, in vivo, sorry, injections of, of LPS, that's a, a, a lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is a toll-like receptor, in, activates innate response by glial cells, basically. And, and in, induces a production of cytokines and, and inflammatory molecules. And to test this, we actually, during the perfusion, at the end of the perfusion, we inject LPS in, in the, uh, the dorsal part of the frontal cortex, and then basically wait half an hour, and then uh, remove that um, piece of the cortex and basically do ELISA test and using a standard kit. And we can see induction of, of, of cytokines and inflammatory responses in control Back perfusion, sorry, back perfusion, 
uh, but not in the control and, and, and indicating that for this to be able, the cells have to be viable. Of course, the question that probably everybody was interested in was, okay, can we use this technology to study, to study connections and cells? And so to make story short, here are the EM examples from CA1. Again, this is the part of the brain that is most susceptible to ischemia. It has been known that neurons die here. It's a selective vulnerability of this, and it's not yet known why. And so actually most of our studies that focused on this region, because if we can save these cells, then it means that we are doing something that hopefully is good. And, and for these cells and their survival. And so this is a synopsis. And you can see that actually even after 10 hours of PMI, uh, as well as a control, you can see synapses because the synapse is actually very ragged structure in the brain and that has been known survives the PMI. But you can see that these presynaptic boutons are have very few uh, vesicles, unlike a short PMI as well as our perfusion. And you can see that. So basically, and you can even, if you look carefully, you can even see that some of these vesicles are fusing. Of course, we wanted to see what happens with the global activity. All experiments were done with the measuring global activity using either B system and more recently, and then uh, using an ECOG. So the way we put electrodes on the surface of the brain, we observed a, a uh, on 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 uh, that um, isoelectric. So there is no global synchronized activity, which is re required for brain to have awareness or even uh, consciousness. And then this is a very important. This is where uh, when the study leaked out, most of public a little bit got confused. Uh, so there is no activity in the brain when it's perfused because we also have inhibitors just to let you know. However, when we stop the perfusion, we washed out the perfusate, we make organotypic tissue slices, move those organotypic slices to a controlled medium, which is a cell culture medium. It has no inhibitors, no our perfusate. The cells can are electrically active. And you can see here in, in, in the C, uh, you see voltage traces as well as inward and outward currents mediated by voltage dependent sodium and potassium can indicating that these cells are at least some of them again we don't know how many are uh, active and of course since what is lastly uh, since now we have evidence that at least some of the features of neurons and, and glial function are preserved not all of them we can now test what happens with the global metabolism and the good thing about it is remember it's isolated brain so we know what goes in and we can measure what goes out. So we are collecting every half an hour uh, what uh, the perfusion comes out. And then we could see what happens to consumption of, of, of oxygen. The brain is consuming oxygen. As you can see, arteria versus venous gradient. It's consuming glucose. And actually, these numbers look very similar to what has been reported in vivo. It also produces CO2 as well. It stabilizes many of the metabolites are important. So indicating that we can now test that brain is metabolically active. Uh, and so the, the, the bottom line in all of these implications is that we have a technology that has two implications. One is a research platform. We think that has a potential to change this, the way we study cells and then circuits in post-mortem brain, including maybe one day in disease brain. We have never done any of this in human brain, but uh, we have done it only in pig brain. So just to let you so far. And, and, and also we do, I think that our technology is show signs of neuroprotection. Uh, first, that anoxic cell death is not immediate, actually. That cells in anoxic that may be injured brain can be revived under certain conditions. And we hope to really use this technology to better understand how cells in the brain react to circulatory arrest or anoxia, or global ischemia, and really try to develop this technology to, uh, to the point where hopefully we could intervene and salvage these cells. Uh, regarding ethical consideration, and from the beginning, we actually included two important things which really help us guide us to these studies. First, we actually had, a, we would call it, I think, embedded bioethicist that was Steve Latham, and actually, we actually took him to lunch <laughs> and tried to tell him what we want to do. And then he said, okay, that's interesting. And, 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 and then also we set up a ethics committee as well advisory committee. Uh, in the beginning was local. I actually also contacted my couple of program officers that I knew at NIH. So we set up also advisory board there. We had actually four meetings before the paper was published. Uh, we monitor uh, cortical uh, uh, global activity using uh, 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 clinical uh, instruments that are used in clinics, you know, most advanced uh, ECOG, uh, which is grids on the uh, surface. We also use EEG, by the way. And what I want to say, and that, you know, what clinically defined, this is not a living brain, at least to my definition, this is basically a cellular active brain. It's like, 
And uh, also we, uh, we had the, also anesthetics, so we, we wanted to monitor activity because we didn't want brain to get into too, too activity. That was not our goal. And really, I feel thinking about this for last almost eight years, I think we need to have strict ethical guidelines about possibility, what it happens. And, you know, and we do think our technology may be able to recover the brain fully. We haven't done that. And we still keep the inhibitors and really an anesthesia and potentially apply this uh, brain to uh, human brains. I think that we haven't done it. We don't have a plans. And I do think it's important to really have a discussion about whether ethically and morally is justifiable. Anyway, uh, at the end, I would like to thank all my colleagues here listed, including PI. These are PIs at Yale that are part of this and effort, and we are testing this technology. And, and this is a really team effort. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sestan. That was uh, terrific. You know, you're absolutely right that this study raised a whole series of ethical questions and lots of uh, commentary around it. In fact, Nature published not one, but two ethics commentaries uh, in alongside your paper. And uh, one was written by me and my colleague at Case Western Reserve, Stuart Youngner, and another commentary was written by um, Hank Greeley and Nita Farahani. Um, so now I want to turn it over to our discussant, Dr. Robert Trug. Um, Dr. Trug, he is the Francis Glessler Lee Professor of Medical Ethics. He's Professor of Anesthesiology and Pediatrics and Director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Trug also practices pediatric intensive care medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. And among the specialties are ethical issues around brain death and organ transplantation. I'd really like to hear some of your thoughts on um, this work, and um, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Shug. All right, thank you, uh, Insu. Um, are you seeing me in uh, presentation view? Presentation view. Meaning you're, yeah, you're seeing one slide, right? I'm seeing slides and, and future slides. Oh, let me just let me just try again and just see if I can correct that. Uh, Oh, I, okay. Why are we having so much trouble today with our, uh, with our slides? Most of the here. talks we give from laptops, and this is my first time from my office, and <laughs> my screen is so big, so it splits it into two. That's the, probably your problem, too. So you have actually. Did I, did I fix that? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, wow. What a, what a fascinating um, presentation, uh, Dr. Seston. Thank you. And this has certainly been something we've talked a lot about uh, within the bioethics community. So uh, let me share some uh, reflections on uh, what I see as the ethical implications of this work. And I'm going to divide my comments into uh, those related to animal welfare and those related to human well-being. Uh, Bob, we can see your um, speaker view back again. You can. Okay. Uh, yes. Now it's fine. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Insu. Sure. Um, okay. So for animal welfare, uh, I think uh, the ethical issues we'll discuss are based on the assumption that the methods used to kill animals for food production are humane. That's sort of taken as a given. Um, you know, that being said, I think that we would probably all agree that being slaughtered is probably not a pleasant experience. Um, and so uh, I think that that translates into a commitment not to completely eliminating anything that might be painful, but reducing pain as much as possible, consistent with the goal of producing meat for our consumption. Um, and I, I think in that sense, the, the ethical standards of the investigators were exemplary. Um, also want to uh, um, revisit here the emphasis that was placed on several distinctions looking at cellular activity in isolation, looking at what might be organized electrical activity of the brain, and then looking at what might be truly brain functioning, such as the presence of consciousness. And uh, in the paper, it said it is important to distinguish between resuscitation of neurophysiological activity and recovery of integrated brain functions. And so uh, to this end, inhibitors were used as described to minimize uh, neuronal interaction, uh, again, focusing primarily on cellular activity in isolation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the use of the EEG to 
detect organized activity. Uh, as the authors acknowledge, this is an unreliable indicator of consciousness. We know that patients who are anesthetized or those that we believe to be unconscious in a persistent vegetative state do retain EEG activity. And EEG only measures activity that's at the surface of the brain. So you don't know what might be going on uh, deeper down in the tissue. But I was struck, uh, Dr. Sistan, as you, went, as you went through it, how much you emphasized that you saw no EEG activity um, and that this was so important. And if you did, how you would react. And so it got me to thinking a little bit about, well, what if you did see some EEG activity? And what if it closely resembled a human EEG? And uh, that made me think a little bit about a paper that I know Insu is very familiar with, um, work from the lab of Allison Wodry in UC San Diego. And uh, let me just say a, a word about what they did. Uh, they took uh, human neural stem cells and they grew them in a dish for, for many months, actually up to nine months. And as the cell grew, they self-organized and they form layers like we see in the human cortex. And they eventually grew to be about the size of a pea. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is that they also recorded EEG activity from these tiny little uh, you know, pea-sized clumps of cells. And it developed over time. And so you can see it becoming more organized, more complex, more rhythmic. And by eight months, they were seeing uh, organized electrical activity that they reported to be indistinguishable from what you would see in a premature baby. And so uh, uh, Dr. Sistan, not to take anything away from your emphasis upon not having EEG activity, but like, even if you did, what would we make of it? So, you know, if this were happening in your lab, would you also feel compelled, for example, to anesthetize these little clumps? Or, you know, what do you do when you're done with the experiment um, uh, and they die? Do you, do, you, do you bury them? I mean, are they like, you know, little humans that died or, or do you throw them out with the other laboratory stuff uh, at the end of the day? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I commend you on what you did with the EEG, but I, I think when we're worried about things like, like consciousness, it, it gets to be kind of complicated. How, how we actually um, determine whether consciousness is present or not. Um, and in this regard, I think there might be some interesting lessons that we can learn from the clinical diagnosis of brain death. Because when we diagnose uh, brain death, we also have to determine that the patient is irreversibly unconsciousness. So, unconscious. So we want to be sure that no consciousness exists and so that brings up the question of, can we reliably diagnose unconsciousness? And this has been a problematic uh, area in neurology. So for a long time, we thought that we could. And so when neurologists would go to the bedside of a patient who was thought to be unconscious in a persistent vegetative state, they felt, again, pretty confident that they could do a physical exam and say, whether or not this person is conscious. Um, we now know that uh, that's not a very uh, reliable determination. And in fact, when neurologists do this as a bedside exam, they're wrong about 40% of the time. And we know that because we've taken some of the patients that, we, that they thought were unconscious. And when you put them in an fMRI scanner, they're actually able to answer yes or no questions by lighting up differential parts of their brain. So, you know, when it comes to many patients, it's very uncertain as to whether we're able to tell whether they're conscious or not. But I would say that the situation is a little bit different when we diagnose patients as being brain dead. And in this situation, I think we actually have a way of being very confident. And it is because we focus on the functioning of the brainstem. Let me just say a word about why I think that matters. So here, uh, you know, looking at a, uh, a human brain here, 
And we know that you know most of what we we regard as our thinking and our cognitive activity is happening up here in the cortex. But actually, there is this system of neurons here in the brainstem called the reticular activating system, a network of neurons, which is responsible for maintaining awakeness, for making us awake. And if that's not functioning, we can't be awake. And if we can't be awake, we can't be conscious. Now, we can't actually test the functioning of this group of neurons directly. But we do know that this network is in close proximity to a number of other brainstem nuclei, such as those that control constriction of the pupil or our gag reflex or, or you know, other brainstem reflexes. And so our brain death testing looks at the function of these other nuclei very carefully, determines that they're not working. And if they're not working, we infer that the RAS, which is right next to them, also isn't working. And if the RAS isn't working, then we infer that the patient is unconscious. And this is important because it allows us to be highly certain when we, when we diagnose brain death that the patient is not conscious without having to look at all of this complicated structure up here where determining a lack of function is much more problematic. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm not sure, maybe Sistan you, 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 or uh, Nanad, you've talked about this, but I'm wondering if in your work, if removal of the pig brainstem could actually be a way of really providing assurance that your pigs are unconscious, even, you know, even if you were to very successfully resuscitate other parts of the brain, show integrated activity and function, if they didn't have this part of the brainstem. I don't know how the anatomy of a pig necessarily relates to that of a human, but if a pig has a reticular activating system, eliminating that could be a way of being more confident that you're not crossing any ethical barriers there. Um, and so uh, uh, in terms of animal welfare, I think your plans to use cooling or anesthetic in the event that organized uh, electrical activity is seen, I think that's wise and prudent. And I think you got great advice from from uh, Steve Latham about that. Um, but I also think let's, let's be um, aware we shouldn't uh, fool ourselves into believing that we actually have a good understanding of the definition or the neurological substrates of the phenomenon of consciousness. This remains uh, a, a lot of uncharted territory. So I think what you did was good, but uh, we shouldn't just go, oh yeah, absolutely. We know what was going on in those pig brains or even in human brains in a similar condition. Um, and then the, the second thing I want to address is this issue of, of human well-being um, and talk a little bit about what I would imagine to be the benefits of this kind of research. And um, I, I see, I, I, I hope I'm right about this, that the benefits of the research could be understood in, proved, in terms of improved understanding of the neurophysiology of the injured brain and that that will lead to improved outcomes for patients suffering from brain injury. And particularly the type of injury that we call hypoxic ischemic injury, a lack of blood flow and oxygen to the brain, as opposed to example, for, uh, from traumatic injury where the brain is actually physically, physically injured. And um, uh, my presumption, again, I hope I'm right here, is that since the BrainX technology requires an isolated brain for at least the near future, this, these benefits would likely be indirect. I don't imagine that you're uh, you know, hypothesizing that you would remove a brain from a brain injured patient, resuscitate it with brain X, and then put it back into the patient. That, yes, you're shaking your, I mean, of course, that's not gonna be the case. But what you are gonna learn is, um, what, what can we learn about the cellular physiology so that we, when we do see patients with brain injury, we'll have a better understanding about how to resuscitate those brains uh, in vivo. And so this sort of raises the question about how we look at the ethics of neuroresuscitation research in general. Um, and in that sense, I would say the risks of doing this research would be very similar to other types of neuroresuscitation research. And the question that comes up is what's the potential that we will do more harm than good. And let me give a couple of examples. So uh, I do critical care medicine. And one of the uh, uh, treatments that we now use routinely in newborns with hypoxic ischemic injury is hypothermia to cool 
the body down. And there's currently research that's going on in adults uh, for this as well. Similarly, in patients who have traumatic brain injury, there's work, work that has been done on decompressive craniectomy, which is where you remove a section of the patient's skull to relieve the pressure in the brain and allow the brain to expand. Um, so there's been a lot of work that's been done here. And, and you know, some of it's been highly successful, but along the way, it's often come under scrutiny because for many of these resuscitative techniques, you can, you can improve overall survival in the patients, but this comes at the cost of increasing survival with, with, in patients with profound neurological disability. So you know, anytime you use, I think, one of these neuroresuscitative approaches, you run the risk that patients who otherwise might have died are going to end up surviving, but in a terrible neurologic state. And you know, so that's something that I think we have to think about. Um, I gave two examples there. Another slightly different, but I think dramatic one uh, was one that um, ethicist Joe Finns describes in his book, Rights Come to Mind, where he talks about a, a research subject, Greg Pearson, who entered a study in a minimally conscious state. So often completely unconscious, sometimes with just a little bit of consciousness. And he had an electrode placed for deep brain stimulation. Um, and it worked it restored him to a state of consciousness. I mean, the research was successful. And now that he was conscious, they asked him, do you want us to keep doing this? Should we keep stimulating your brain? And he said, no, this is terrible. I hate living in a case in a state like this. And so they stopped. And you know, it's pretty remarkable when you think about it, that this was really the first time that personal agency had been restored to a person with a neuroprosthetic device such that the person could actually then competently refuse to have the intervention. So um, no, I guess to maybe uh, um, summarize this, it would, it would be that you know, um, efforts to improve neuroprotection, obviously a good thing. I mean, the, 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 the morbidity that comes with, with neurological injury is profound in our society, but um, it's, 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 not, you know, it's not always with, with great outcomes. Um, or without risks, I should say. Um, finally, the last thing I wanna say is, is the impact on organ procurement. Um, so some commentators, in, in, including uh, Insu and his colleague, uh, Dr. Yugner, um, have worried quite a bit that techniques to restore neurological function to patients with profound in, uh, brain injury could negatively impact organ procurement and transplantation. And so as they wrote about in Nature, the idea would be that those who would otherwise have agreed to donate organs, in other words, diagnosis of brain death and organ donation would opt instead for experimental neuroresuscitative efforts. And therefore they would never be able to be diagnosed as brain dead. And, and then you know, we would have the loss of these organs. Um, I'm not saying that this is an unreasonable concern, but I think that it's very unlikely. Um, uh, uh, so let me just explain why, is that um, uh, I think that we are rapidly advancing the capability to develop transplantable organs from pigs. So here was an article in the New York Times a while back on uh, the use of gene editing. And there's many variations of this that are being done experimentally now. Uh, one that I'm maybe more familiar with is being done at Harvard Medical School in George Church's lab, actually now in a spin-off company uh, from his research where they're editing pig genomes um, to make it so that humans don't have an immunologic reaction when you transplant the pig organ into a human, and also to get rid of all the uh, infectious viruses that pigs tend to be uh, tend to have a lot of. And um, uh, now, you know, maybe this is over optimistic, but the various companies that are doing this are actually estimating that they could be in clinical trials within a matter of a few years. This would be absolutely revolutionary because it would create basically an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. And we could, we could talk about that. I don't think that would be an unadulterated good either. You know, suddenly everybody could have as many organs as they wanted. That would come with its own problems. Um, but as you know, as I look and uh, Dr. Sistan, tell me if, if it's different. I mean, I see your work as really progressing over a longer time frame than this. And my guess would be is that 
before we have to worry about reducing the number of brain dead patients and therefore the availability of transplantable organs, I think we are likely going to have alternatives to people as, as the, the source of organs for transplantation. So um, my last slide, my conclusions would be, I think the risk of restoring consciousness and resuscitated pig brains is small. Consciousness is a very complex activity. I think all of the things that you've done to, 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 to reduce concerns about that are great. Um, but I, I think actually there's the potential for you to develop this research much more and start to look at uh, communication between neurons and even neuronal function in ways that would avoid um, uh, uh, risks of the brains becoming conscious um, and suggest, I don't know, maybe that you know, removing the brain, the brain stem from the pig preparation could be one way of doing that. Um, I would say that improvements in neural resuscitation could benefit many who suffer from hypoxic ischemic or traumatic brain injury, but that these efforts don't always have a happy ending. And there's, there's bad outcomes as well as the potential for wonderful outcomes. Uh, I am less concerned that these technologies will reduce the supply of transplantable organs. I think that pigs are more likely going to be the solution to the organ shortage and not part of the problem. So with that, I'll stop. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bob, for uh, your perspective on all these issues. Before we turn to uh, questions that are now starting to trickle in, Dr. Sesson, did you want to respond to anything that Dr. True just said? Uh, first, I agree with everything Bob said. I, I, I just want to say these are all important questions that, that require careful, total consideration. You know, the way we approach everything in the lab, I give moral consideration to everything. Everything I do in life from plastics to, 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 to everything. And, and so, uh, so that's it. So um, we don't know how useful or even at all would be useful our technology. We don't know that. Uh, we are progressing relatively slowly for two reasons. One is just the nature of doing research. But the second one is, uh, as I said, we have advisory committee of, of really, I felt, top experts that NIH has picked up for us. And uh, we want to be sure we actually carefully discuss every experiment we have done with them. So that's just a point. I don't have a formed opinion on, on one of those things that's organoids, because I do organoids, but I just, this is not something I do a lot in the lab, or it's not. So it's very hard, I mean, I, and, and, and and the question now is the activity, uh, what does it represent? I mean, because I, I see in the Q&A, somebody wrote a really excellent, David wrote the question and, and, and you know, the, the brain is not isolated organ. And I agree, you know, the question is, can you even recover the brain hypothetically ex vivo without being uh, peripheral input? I don't know that, to be honest. Uh, one other thing that occurred to us and we have we made our technology available to everybody. So we shared everything. Whoever wanted to come, even during COVID, we opened the lab for them. And one of the uses that other groups have tried and want to use in ex vivo regeneration of organs. So basically from the same patients and some physicians are very interesting in like when you have a liver cancer, take the liver out, treat it with um, chemotherapy without treating the whole body, put the same liver back when it's clean. Uh, that's one use that others are investigating and using our technology. So uh, we still don't know what will be useful. And again, we don't know how useful it would be. I agree with you that you have to be very careful with everything you do in life because you don't know whether you are doing more good or good harm. But just the way I've been thinking about it, and this is somebody who actually has been thinking about this longer than me, says it's like a CPR. We give CPR to the patient. You know, should we give everybody CPR? And we do give them. It's our own. Uh, and it's important to, to really be very thoughtful and careful about everything you do, especially as scientists. So. Um, so let me turn to some audience questions that have come in, and I'm going to continue on with the question you, you started with from David Jones. Um, and this is related to a suggestion that Bob Trug actually just had. Um, would removing the do you have to, to, to prepare the brain for brain X, the pig brain, do you have to sever the medulla or the spinal cord and what damage does this do yeah. to the system? And as a corollary, what if you were to remove part of the brain stem as Dr. True suggested, was that so, practical? So just the one, one important thing, okay, so, so 
the way we do this is was designed also by how the food was uh, how the pig is processed. So unfortunately, we or fortunately, I, I don't have any interference. It's used USDA uh, approved facility, and actually we do it on Tuesday when there is a USDA agent there. Just to let you know. <laughs> And, and, and so they, they process animal, we don't enter the facility, so we don't know how they process the animal, just to let you know, okay? And, and, and they sever it, so we cannot you know, ask them to remove the full CNS, so we never tried to do that, just to let you know. So the reason we did it this way was necessity, okay? And, and, and so just that explains why we did it. Uh, we have never removed the uh, brainstem. The problem is that you cannot do this by removing brainstem because you have to have blood vessels intact. And removing the brain with blood intact is an incredibly difficult problem, okay? So basically we use colleagues that work in neurosurgery to help us do this in a dead pig. In this case, what we get is a really skull. We get skull and we bring it in, in, into the lab and then try to use the tool so because you don't wanna sever the blood vessel, just to let you know. So again, this is dictated how this is done. And just cost benefit ratio, we would never be able to do this with the whole pig. It's just, it was, and I didn't feel that that was justifiable, at least at that time. I just, if you can do something without sacrificing animal, I think it's always good. Uh, and it's the route to take. So, one thing I want to say, it's in the paper. I study uh, long range connectivity, and one of the tracks that we are very interested in and have been working on is cortical spinal tract. So when you sever, severe um, cut, sever, the, the, the brainstem, you completely cut, axotomize corticospinal tract axon. And so the first thing I wanted to know, actually, and when they show me sections, I was, is that the, uh, these cells are called bad cells. They are largest neurons in the cerebral cortex. It, they are actually very easy to identify. They only exist in primary. They look, I mean, I shouldn't say, they look like they are from the, you know, live animal. While the one in the control, they actually are dying. That is, you know, they basically, you cannot even find them in the control perfusion. So, and again, we haven't went beyond that point, just to let you, just to let you. And, and so, but just preserving these cells to study them just morphologically is what we were hoping to do, just to let you know. And just that I think would be, you could consider that some level of success. We don't know whether we are preserving them and freezing them in time or really reviving them because we haven't, you know, really tested this. But we think that they, they, they are not dead. And for several reasons is they look really remarkably healthy, you know, in, in, in assays that healthy cells would do. Okay. So that's just, we have never made slices for motor cortex, just practically there is a limit. We focused on hippocampus because we knew that. But if, and again, this is a very huge if, if these cells are not dead, even though their axons are cut, that will be tremendous success. That means that something in our perfusion technology is helping these cells not to die. One other important thing that also I wanna make clear everybody, this is not really neurologically functioning brain. I mean, they just, you know, and, and, but another thing is that we don't know to what level do we even save these cells. For this to be really something you would need to really do this for a long period and try, you know, maybe we are just preventing inevitable. You know, as I tell everybody, it's like finding somebody on the street, uh, let's say they had a cardiac arrest and their heart stopped, let's say four hours earlier. I don't think this could be done in humans, just, just my honest opinion, just make it, you know, I, I really have been having conversations with this long period of time. And I do think that these humans, even if they, they would be neurological. So going back to what Bob said, you have to, there has to be strict regulations about this. Just, I, this is my imperative. Uh, and, but imagine that you give somebody CPR and, and they open their eyes and that's where we stop the experiments. <laughs> so now the question is this person going to survive or they are just going to close the eyes and die. And so this is analogous, just make everybody clear. We haven't done any of those experiments. Uh, and so we don't know to what extent we are saving these cells and, and this requires a lot of work and, and it's just not easy designing the experiments to be very thoughtful and careful. Um, so there's so much to talk about because we have questions that we can always ask about detail. Uh, well, let me ask a question about, um, some people have already asked this uh, in the chat. Um, 
Dr. Sisson, how, how do you see this translating into human clinical work, if at all? It, what, is it going to be indirect the way that Dr. Trug suggested, or do you have a more direct application of this technology? So one of the biggest problems we are experiencing now is that we have so many requests from colleagues that are doing this. And, and the problem is this is not how to say it's something that is easily translatable into somebody's lab because the technology is still um, the, 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 you know, it's just uh, complex technology. It's not like a buying a, a new antibody, <laughs> just to explain. So, but we actually have built machines for other labs and stuff like that, just to mention. And I, I can tell you what others have been thinking about using this. Uh, I, I want to stick with the brain. So, seeing how well this is working with other organs, uh, that has been under, that's undergoing current research by other groups, and we know what they are, have as a result. So, the question is to what extent can you use principles that we have identified here, uh, uh, other organs. Also testing other models of ischemia from cardiac arrest as well as a stroke, that also is undergoing. Uh, and then I'm not sure if anybody's doing that, but really thinking about along the lines, we had oncologists really talking to us, could you use some of this to keep organs ex vivo from the patient and instead of like, uh, like if somebody has a kidney cancer Unfortunately, we have to give them systemic uh, chemotherapy, which would be good if you could avoid. A uh, person has two kidneys, so you can take one out, treat it, help it heal, make sure that they don't have and give it, put it back. I had a cardiologist and cardio surgeons, and actually we actually, some of them came to the lab asking, okay, what if somebody has dilated heart that has some kind of heart malformations, we take the heart out, give them, put them on a pump and discard the heart. Maybe we can recover that heart and, and really put it back in the same person. And again, there is no immunosuppression needed because it's the same person. We also get a lot of inquiries actually from both labs and companies. And again, we, are, we have shared the equipment as well as, 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 as uh, the agents, uh, labs and, and companies that are doing 3D organs. Uh, they, okay, we need a technology that can maintain these 3D organs uh, and you know, the problem is, is you have to develop something that is not blood, that is not packed red blood cells. And what we have is a really can work as a blood. Uh, and so we have provided our reagents to everything to these companies. And so far, there seems to work. Uh, I don't know how well, because of course, <laughs> they don't tell you everything, but considering that they are still talking to us and asking, you know, so, so there are many applications. And, and, and so some of them really have very low concern as, 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 as you know, societal and, and, and public health, but some of course have. I also have a lot of requests uh, from colleagues all over the world to use this in the human brain. I refuse to be part of those studies and I don't think that should be done, just to mention. Uh, maybe, maybe, and again, three times, maybe one day, but I think before we ever come to that, that has to be a lot of work done to make sure that we don't do any harm. And uh, so, I have a standard answer to them. You know, you have rights to whatever is published, but I really refuse to share equipment and reagents for those experiments. And unfortunately, we had those uh, requests. And I am sure, considering how aggressive they were in requesting, and I felt bad because I like to share everything, but I really didn't feel comfortable sharing something at this moment. Maybe in 10 years that we have enough knowledge that this could be used for, let's say, somebody undergoing stroke or something like that. But I do think that, again, what Bob said, it's very important to, to, to come to the realization that the chance that we do more good than bad is you know, better odds. And this is why we have cell culture, this is why we have animal research. You know, the reason we give animals cancer is not to torture animals and give them cancer, is to really test this before we use it in humans. And so here is an example of something that actually should be really carefully, uh, you know, so controlled and, and, and really, really have ethical guidance and some kind of consensus. Right. Um, so I have a question for Dr. True. Uh, so what if, if we were to define death as irreversible and, um, and so organ, procurement is ethical only if uh, the patient is dead. Uh, doesn't this kind of research 
upset a little bit of the assumptions made that uh, you know after cardiac arrest you sort of give 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 some time a few minutes maybe 30 minutes 20 minutes before you procure the organ I mean if in principle doctor assistance work suggests that maybe the, the brain is much more resilient uh, and and maybe I'm not all functioning as lost of course there's a whole question of how much functioning is necessary for life and for consciousness. But, um, but uh, does that throw into doubt some of the sort of assumptions that people have made about when it would be ethically appropriate to procure organs? I was curious about your thoughts on that point. Yeah, really great questions. And Sue, I, I guess I'd uh, respond in a couple of ways. One is that brain death does not require the death of all the cells in the brain. It requires the, the uh, irreversible loss of all functions of the brain. That in itself is a bit problematic because our current criteria don't actually guarantee the loss of all functions, but I won't go there. But um, there's also a distinction made between permanence and irreversible. And uh, let me describe it as follows, is that we consider the loss of a function to be permanent if it will become irreversible, assuming that nothing is done to, uh, to attempt to reverse it, uh, which is the case when people normally die. So. Um, you know, the loss of consciousness would become permanent before it would actually irreversible because we've made a decision not to attempt to resuscitate the brain. In the same way that we say cardiac arrest is permanent, um, but not irreversible if a patient has a DNR order, we've made a decision that we're not gonna to attempt to resuscitate the heart. And I think that that's kind of core in how we think about uh, issues of brain death so that we would say in order to be brain dead, your brain would have to permanently have lost functions um, but whether that would be irreversible is going to depend a lot on what you choose to do. And as technologies develop, um, what we think of as being irreversible could very well change. Wow. Thank you for that very clear answer. That was very helpful. I mean, just to, to really make all of this even more complex, one thought experiment, just think about if somebody is declared brain dead, what if you put the stem cells into this person's brain and, and these stem cells will grow and create activity? I mean, is this now reversal of, 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 of death. I don't know the answer to that. And, 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 you know, because even if you reverse some function, this person may not remember anything, it might be just tabula rasa. So I, I do think that the, the technologies are here, not yet, that would really make all of this incredibly difficult to answer. And I think we'll have such gray areas that as a society will be divided what to do. And, uh, you know, there are companies that are developing these technologies. And, you know, to me, I just, to me, this is not even thought experiment. This will be done and it will work. And I just don't know what to be outcome. You know, is the person going to have any memory, any knowledge who they are? And I think they will not. I mean, probably they will have something very fragmentary. Now you have to decide, is this a new person or this is a, you know, I, I, I think, you know, that, that this is really, and, and an important time in, in our history of society where, um, you know, science, you know, it's like, a, it's like almost to me, it's like a, right brothers, you know, like, you know, we can fly, <laughs> but not everybody's realizing what fly can do this or, or, or I, Otto Hahn and, and Lisa Metrit splitting the atom, you know, uh, you know, you could use it for good things and but all technologies can be abused. I mean, CRISPR was a good example, how it was abused. And, but also CRISPR is something that can really help society. And, and, and so I think that, that, that this is really incredibly hard and complex questions that will not be resolved. And I don't think that whatever guidelines we put as a society and uh, ethicist scientists will, will need to tweak them because something new will come, you know, and, and really made us think about it. So. Well, I think those are perfect comments to conclude the session on. We're out of time. I want to thank our guest, Nana Sestan, and our commentator, Dr. True, for joining us today. I want to thank everybody uh, uh, on behalf of the Center for Bioethics that sponsored the series. Thank you for joining us today. I also want to especially thank Ashley Troutman and Angela Alberti, who helped me organize this series. I could not do this without your help. Please join us next month for our very last uh, session for the series. It will be on April 16th. My guest will be Magdalena Zernica Getz, and she'll be talking about her groundbreaking work, culturing human embryos up to the 14 day limit. So we're really looking forward to that presentation. So thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Goodbye. Thank you everybody. I'm sorry for not answering all the questions. I see that I'm one of the questions. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you and thank you Ashley.